So how do neurons work? And the one thing I did, I, I brought you in here, but I actually, well, I want to show you this before I show you the video. I actually had this video made for me because there's one thing about this particular figure that I can't stand. They start in the middle of the neuron. Why don't we start at the start of the neuron? You're talking about propagation, so start at the beginning. Don't start in the middle of things, you know? It's like uh, um, only fancy art house stories start in the middle of the story. You, otherwise, you're confused, right? You're like, why is that guy doing that thing, you know? Um, I like those stories, but I like my scientific figures to actually start at the beginning. The beginning is step five, when the acetylcholine comes across and it binds the receptor, and then it lets in sodium. And also, the other thing I don't like about this is it's standing still. Now, we don't have Harry Potter textbooks, but we do have computers. And so I can show you how it actually moves rather than having 15 steps. So I'm going to show you this thing. Now, the irony is the artist spent a lot of time doing this, and I can't find it anymore online because it is Flash, and uh, everyone's decided that Flash is evil, and it will cause your computer to blow up if you put it on it. But apparently we have a flash player on this computer, so stand back and uh, I'll play it. Um, you, you can't find this online anymore, but, uh, and I, I don't know how to play it. Okay, so here's our neuron. There's our uh, sodium letting in receptor at the top. You can imagine acetylcholine coming in. And I want you to see how the charge flows. A flow of sodium charge comes in and diffuses through the cell. Voltage activated sodium channels will let in sodium. Then, later, voltage-activated potassium channels let out potassium, and the positive charge moves down the cell because it is let in fast and let out slow. Again, the, um, the artist sort of shows this, but you can see the, the sequence. The sequence is as it moves on down, and then at the very end, don't look at this because he had a typo. That should say calcium instead of sodium because calcium is the only thing that actually has the charge and the power to be able to actually bind these vesicles and actually twist them and move them around. These are vesicles of acetylcholine. They join with the membrane, release their payload, and start the next synapse firing. So realize that what it comes down to is you have positive charge being let in by a fast voltage-activated channel, the vo voltage change also turns on the potassium channel, but it's slower, and it lets the charge out. Faster in, slower out. And because of that time difference between the two channels, that's how you get a soluble chemical to actually move in one direction. You have two different chemicals. One goes in, one goes out, and you have two different times. Sodium comes in faster, potassium goes out slower. And then the architecture of the membrane does the, does the rest. It channels it so that you end up with a pulse of positive charge moving down. So, imagine, I don't know if you'll get any of these references, okay? But I have lots of, maybe I'll just ask you, does this remind you of a movie? If the hero is running down the street, and there's something like exploding behind, it's usually him. The, if you can find a her example, I would love to use it. Uh, so the, the hero's running down the street, and stuff's exploding behind them as they run. So that's kind of like, any, is there a specific Indiana Jones thing? Okay, the, the huge boulder is an idea. I like the idea of explosions because those are more chemical in nature, but the huge boulder, if you can think of the boulder as being a chemical cloud of sodium ions, you can imagine Indiana Jones running down the tunnel as being like the propagation of the signal, okay? Um, the, 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 that's a, a, a more, the, the, the only difference with the explosions is that you have, you have these explosions of charge that are going on down the proton, down the uh, neuron as they go. Anybody think of a movie that does that? I have two examples, and I would like more, okay? Have you ever seen Forrest Gump when he was running? Oh, when Forrest Gump was running? <laughs> I don't remember that scene of Forrest Gump, but if it happened, I, I'm sure that, I'm sure, oh yeah, 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 no, that's, uh, that, that is it. 
That's awesome. Yeah, Forrest Gump of Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and, and uh, that would be a good. Okay. Black Widow is going in next year. Okay. Um, <laughs> she's a. Uh, it's not enough representation, but it's a part. It's a start, right? Um, so, the Rocketeer has an example that I think is perfect because it has a Zeppelin exploding, and he's running along the top, and like the different sections of the Zeppelin are exploding as he goes, and it's that kind of idea. The propagation of the explosion is like the propagation of the sodium cloud moving in rather than moving out. Maybe it's the potassium. It's the potassium moving out, you know, as he as it, as he goes. Batman Begins, the Batmobile driving down and all the manhole covers flying up. It's kind of like that, you know? So, and I'm sure there's others. Black Widow, okay. The whole main thing is that you have two reactions going on that have different times and different substrates, okay? But same charge, positive charge in both cases. We can even ask the question of why are potassium channels slower? They have to squeeze out extra water molecules before reactivating, and that's because potassium is bigger than sodium. This sounds like a fundamental chemical reason to where if life evolved on another planet, it would also have to evolve so that sodium would be the thing coming in and potassium would be the thing going out, because otherwise you could not get a propagation of signal. It's uh, just one of those things that's interesting. Potassium being bigger than sodium, is going to naturally be slower. It's always going to have to be the one that goes out. Now you could ask the question of could you have a lithium based one, but there's, I have my arguments against that. So the, here's a picture of the, the end of the road, the synaptic vesicles. That's really more of a cell biology type thing, but they look really cool. Here's a little cross section of vesicles. You can see all of them inside the cell, these little blue things, and they have neurotransmitters inside. And these will actually dissolve in the membrane, pop open, release the acetylcholine. They, to move those things, they're, they're kind of heavy in a sense. You know, you, you can't ask a little sodium or one charge ion, you can't ask a little um, sodium to move something that heavy. It doesn't have enough charge to stick to it. Calcium, on the other hand, has small, dense charge and double the charge. And it actually is both soluble, available, and strong enough to actually cause the bonds to move. That's one of my arguments why calcium is the best for this job. There's the lipids in green. There's the neurotransmitters in blue. Now we can really get to this. This is a computer model of a synapse. And it actually shows it's modeled down to the proteins, and it has them floating around. 300,000 proteins in atomic detail. And uh, they actually have, this is uh, the same resolution as the number of proteins in a, um, or getting to a synapse. This is actually vesicle trafficking, so this might be trafficking to the synapse. Um, I'm not even really clear on it. I just know it was a lot of computer modeling, and we've gotten enough structure, we understand enough dynamics, that we can actually do something like this and get it published in Science or Nature. So you can sort of zoom in, you can see there's, even zooming in doesn't really help, right? But the thing is, if we really do understand how neurons work, we should be able to build one that works the same way. And it turns out that they did. So they actually built, not the propagation part of the neuron, but the part going in and the part going out, like uh, the, the input and the output of a neuron. So they made a biosensor that responds to glutamate or acetylcholine, and it will produce a voltage, and it will actually, they actually made it the, the fake neuron here, they made it an actual wire. But they attached the wire to an ion pump that instead of being vesicles, it's just a little syringe that will pump out, uh, that will pump out protons or acetylcholine to start another one. And it turns out that you can connect this to a neuron on this end and to a neuron on that end, and it will bridge the gap. It will do the right thing. The, the main chemical difference is it is actually a wire moving charge in one direction. Now, 
like I posted about this on social media, and all these people were like worried that then we'd have like robot overlords. Look at this. It's an ion pump and a biosensor. There's no way. This is like a million times bigger than a neuron. This is never going to take your job away from you. So don't worry about it. W worry about making these things so that then you can do cool things with them. But Mirko? Mm -hmm. Which which one from the beginning, beginning of this part of the lecture? Oh, that that neuron. That was just a real life neuron that you just grew on a silicon chip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think keeping it alive would probably be tricky, but um, once you kept it alive, it would be able to interface with the silicon. And this is a, actually another example like this. In a sense, the neurons here are interfacing with silicon there, yeah, or whatever metal it is. Okay. So here's a good Bill Bryson quote. You may not feel terribly electrical, especially at 417 on a Friday afternoon, but you are. Cells ha have electricity. Now, the question is, why does it take you shifting your feet across shag carpet to shock your little brother or sister? Um, with static electricity. The reason why we are electrical but we don't feel electrical is that it's a tiny scale and it's very well controlled. 0.1 volts, if you measure that up, nanometer distances. But if you scale that up, and you actually could do that if you um, wanted to turn to your physics, it would be 20 million volts per meter, and that's about the same charge carried in a thunderstorm. So it literally is electrical, right? There's specificity here. There's desensitization here, and then there's negative integration. I should say that this, there's probably two of the, of the five. Integration is a little bit weirder in this case, but I think I can make it fit, two and a half. And then we'll talk about how amplification and integration can happen, and we'll use another cell type and another type of signaling. So at the end of the day, we can have Star Wars toys that can have, let you use the force. You aren't touching it, but you can raise the ball by thinking because they have electrodes that will respond to the changes of potentials in your brain neurons. Now, again, incredibly crude. This is not, this is like Padawan level, right? It's not uh, Master Jedi Luke. And I don't even want to talk about force projections because I don't know what, apparently force projections take a lot of energy because uh, you all know what happened at the end of Star Wars 8. If you didn't, I won't spoil it. But, um, but now they have this game, and I would really love to find this game, although we look kind of dorky playing it. Um, but you actually think, you actually move the ball back and forth and you like battle to uh, push the ball and the, your friend is battling to push the ball back. And so, yeah, it, it is like the, the Luke. <laughs> the Luke uh, mind control trick. Um, I have to update that picture, apparently. Um, but uh, the more realistic uses is that you can actually interface between machines that touch, that replace limbs that can actually um, be, uh, as another Star Wars reference, right? Because that's what his hand was, right? But um, it looks like we might actually, the hard part is not generating the force, but it's channeling the force effectively, and I'm literally talking about small f force, by the way, but uh, to have a hand that can actually detect when it's picking up the egg and not crush it, that's actually really hard. But interfacing that with the brain so that you can then think something and have the machine move, it's possible because the brain is like this. Here's a recent example of uh, where we're coming to. This is almost Luke Skywalker level. You can look at this in more detail if you want to see where we are. Or if you have a baby, you will notice that they do this now. They used to be able to not tell if the baby could hear or not. You would look for them to respond to a stimulus, but they don't always respond. They could be sleepy. But now they actually use electrodes to see if their brain is responding. It's like the same thing for that anesthetic thing that we were doing. And it's actually uh, simple. You're just looking for charges being moved in here in response to a sound stimulus coming in there. So neurotransmitters are usually simple molecules. You can see all these other ones. Serotonin is the other one. Um, 
it binds to neuron stimulating receptors like acetylcholine does, but it sends a different signal, it's a different shape. And you know what this looks like? What amino acid does that look like? Tryptophan, right? And so people saw, noticed that turkey actually contains a lot of tryptophan. If you're always sleepy, like you are right now, after Thanksgiving dinner, You've had a feast of, uh, about brains, and so now you're, um, but for different reasons, after Thanksgiving dinner, you get sleepy. And you have that, but it's wrong, okay? It's true that there's a lot of tryptophan in turkey, but if you calculate how much you would have to have, just to have the sedative effect, you'd have to have way too much. The most likely cause is that all the carbs. So blame the carbs. It's actually metabolism and glycolysis and all that stuff and all the blood being diverted to your stomach. It takes about three days to digest a large meal. So the answer is not chapter 12, but chapters 14 through 15, which you already have. So that is, um, and I accidentally have it twice. That is today's lecture. We will finish up the lecture on Wednesday. Um, enjoy not having to study for a test for this. All right? See you Wednesday. All right. <laughs>